Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Isn't it good news this morning, Central, to know that God is indeed on your side? This morning marks the beginning of what is the holiest week on the Christian calendar, appropriately referred to as Holy Week. Throughout this Holy Week season, we will be celebrating the road to the cross that will culminate in the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, specifically on the Christian calendar, is a date referred to historically as the day of the triumphal entry, where Jesus was walked, marched into Jerusalem and was celebrated by a crowd of people. I had this great elaborate sermon prepared to, to mark the beginning of the triumphal entry, but unfortunately I couldn't find a donkey that I could afford. Some of you will get that when you get home. So instead, I will not be preaching from an event in the last week of the life of Jesus. Rather, I will be preaching from an event in the first week of the ministry of Jesus. If you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn in there with me to the second chapter of the gospel according to John, to John chapter 2. I fell in love with this passage while in seminary when one of my professors referred to the miracle of Jesus turning water into wine as the greatest miracle that Jesus ever performed, the greatest miracle that Jesus ever performed. And, and I've waited five years before I could walk through this with you, Central. Could you please stand with me in the honor of the reading of God's word? John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. The ingredients don't have to be there. The ingredients don't have to be there. My Bible reads this way. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone... Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom inside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Will you pray with me? Father, teach us great truths contained in your word. Be exalted as your word is explained as our prayer as always. And, in, and we pray this in Jesus' name and all who are God's people said A third grade student had an argument with his teacher in which he proposed that he could do whatever Jesus did. And as evidence of this, he said that during the science project, he would turn water into wine. The date finally arrived and, and he walked up to present his science project, a, a project that he referred to as the Jesus experiment. He had a bottle of water in hand. 
and he slowly began to pour that bottle of water into a container. And almost magically, if not miraculously, that water began to turn a, a dark red color. You know, the, the color of your favorite glass of Merlot. A fragrance started emitting from that glass. The, the teacher said that even the, the room started to smell like wine. And the student tasted the glass and, and he confirmed that he had indeed turned water into wine. The, the whole class stood up and applauded him. He had done something that Jesus did. The teacher wanted to confirm this for herself. <laughs> so she grabbed the glass and, and she tasted it. It still tasted like water. His grade on the experiment was twofold. She, she first gave him an A for the experiment him, itself, but, but then she gave him an F for thinking that he could do what Jesus could do. He had changed the color of the water. He had even managed to change the fragrance of the water. And, 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 and the water even tasted a little different, but he did not accomplish what Jesus did because at the end of the day, the contents that were in the glass, though it looked like wine, it still was not wine. The, the substance of the water remained the same. There was no transformation that had taken place. In John chapter 2, the story of turning water into wine is a story of real transformation. The water did not remain water, but it was transformed into an entirely different substance. And, and that has great implications for you and I sitting here this morning. If, if Jesus can transform water into wine, then there's no situation in your life that Jesus cannot transform for the better. The first part of the book of John after the prologue is generally referred to as the book of signs. The, the focus of these 11 chapters beginning from verse 2, beginning from chapter 2 all the way through chapter 12, will be on seven signs that Jesus performs, which John says reveals Jesus' glory. The, these signs are pointers. When we accurately interpret these signs, we will come to the realization that Jesus is who he claimed to be, the Messiah and Savior of the world. The first of these signs happen in a familiar territory to Jesus. It happens in Cana of, of Galilee. Cana was just 12 miles outside of Jesus' hometown. And, and Cana was also the hometown of one of Jesus' early followers, Nathaniel. There is a wedding going on at Cana. In the ancient world, Jewish weddings were occasions for great celebration. They, they could last as much as one week long. A week filled with, with dancing, with, with dining. And of course, a week of alcohol drinking. Jesus' mother, unnamed in the text, is present at the wedding. And, and some of you might want to stuff your ears for this one. Jesus was also at the wedding. Jesus did not only bring his plus one, he brought his plus five. He came with a group of five disciples who he had called earlier in the book of John. Jesus' presence at the wedding reminds us that Jesus was not just some hermit who spent all his day praying and, and fasting and, and spiritualizing, but, but rather Jesus was a social Jesus as well. Jesus liked to go to the temple and Jesus liked to go to the party on occasion. Jesus was spiritual as well as being social all at the same time. Go ahead, I know, say it. Some of you want to say amen. <laughs> The wedding had to be of someone that Jesus was very familiar with. It may have been a, a close family friend or, or a close relative because Mary obtains some, inf some private information that she immediately shares with Jesus. In, in verse 3, Mary informs Jesus that 
the wedding party has run out of wine. For some of us, this is not a, a big issue at all, and it's certainly not worth presenting to Jesus. Why, why bother Jesus with a shortage of wine at a wedding? There are more important things in life that, that we should present to Jesus, a, a lack of food, a, a lack of finances, a serious illness, death, blindness, something major. But why bother Jesus with this information? It's at that point we realize that what may be minor to you is major to somebody else. That's why I've learned in my personal life never to judge someone else's problems, never to evaluate somebody else's pain, because just because you've learned to deal with certain issues, certain trials, certain problems, doesn't mean that somebody else has also learned to deal with these issues. What may be trivial to you is tragic to somebody else, and what may be tragic to somebody else is trivial to you. This is a major concern, especially to the wedding party. In the ancient world, to run out of wine was a serious social embarrassment. And, and we know of the ancient world that they operated on an honor and shame system. In a small town such as Cana, imagine what would have happened if people realized that at the wedding of Yaqub bin Isaac, he had run out of wine. The people would have talked about that event for years and years to come. They would have continuously reminded Yaqub bin Isaac. Remember that time I showed up at your wedding and you ran out of wine? What kind of rinky-dink celebration was you putting on to begin with? This was a serious matter to Yaqub bin Isaac, and that's why they brought it to Jesus' attention. At first, Jesus seems uninterested in the problem. He responds to Mary when she brings this t news to him in verse 4. Woman, why do you involve me? Literally, what Jesus is saying is that what part in this do I have? What is there between you and me? This phrase is found in the Bible several times, and it's always found on the lips of someone who wants to completely disassociate himself from a person or from a situation. This phrase is found on the lips of demons when they encounter Jesus. They always bring up, Jesus, why do you want to involve me? So they can completely disassociate themselves from Jesus. This phrase is also found on the lips of King David when he wants to disassociate himself from the actions of his captain of the guard. Jesus is wondering out loud. He's being abrupt and strong, saying, Mary, this is none of my business. I don't care about their shortage of wine. I have more important things to do. If this doesn't sound like the Jesus you know, then you're right. It doesn't sound like the Jesus that Mary knows either. Mary completely ignores what Jesus says and moves on anyway. Jesus is Mary's son. She knows about her son, and she knows about his origins, and, and she knows that it is impossible for Jesus not to be concerned about what people are going through. If it's your business, then it's also Jesus's business. Though Jesus may have said it's none of his business, Mary knew in his heart that it was impossible for Jesus not to care about what people are going through, Central. The good news for you this morning is that Jesus always cares whether your trial is trivial or whether it's tragic, what you're going through. Jesus cares. It's impossible for Jesus to be a disassociated spectator in your life. It's, it's a, impossible for Jesus to be disinterested in what you're going through. It's impossible for Jesus to look at what you're experiencing and, and just glance at it from the sidelines and not involve himself in your situation. Jesus cares too much about you not to get involved. 
I saw on YouTube the other day an interesting heavyweight championship fight before, b between Tony Wilson and Steve McCarthy. They were fighting for the British heavyweight championship of the world. It, it, it was a packed house. And in the front of, of the arena, in the front of the boxing ring, was Tony Wilson's mother. During the first two rounds, she seemed uninterested in what her son was going through. She, she was texting on her phone. She was talking to people on, on the sideline. She, she wasn't paying attention to the match at all. However, things turned for her son for the worse in round three. He got punched and he fell to the ground. And, and for whatever reason, after getting punched that hard, he decided to get back up anyway. It's at this point that his opponent began to, to punch on him, put him on the ropes, punch him time and, and time again. The announcers were wondering, why didn't the referee stop the fight? It was obvious to everyone Tony was over his head. But, but at that point, his mother came charging into the room, into the ring with her shoe off. Some of you might remember this fight. She, she hit Tony's opponent on the head with her heels and the ref stopped the match completely. One minute ago, she was on the sideline doing everything but paying attention to the fight. She seemed a, a disinterested spectator. She had disassociated herself from her son's fight completely. That is, until her son got in trouble. Central, what I'm trying to tell you this morning is that though God may seem disinterested in what you're going through, let you get in trouble. God won't let you go through it alone. God will always step into the match when his children are in trouble. Jesus' words suggest that he's disinterested, that he's not concerned about someone else's business. But Mary knows better. She knows that her son will involve himself in someone else's problem. So, so she says to the servants, do whatever he tells you to do. By the way, Central, that's a good way to live your life, by doing whatever Jesus tells you to do. Jesus gives instructions to the servant. He speaks to the servants and tells them he, after noticing six large stone jars somewhere in the room, they were half filled with water. Jesus instructs them to fill the stone jars to the brim with water. These stone jars, as, as John explains, were, were used for ceremonial purposes. They, they were used for either washing the utensils that the people would eat with or for washing their hands. And Jesus tells the servants to fill these water jars up with water. Let's review again. The problem at the wedding is that they run out of wine. They have no wine. A, a, a serious problem. It could result in years and years of social embarrassment. They have no wine. Jesus gives instructions to the servants to fill the water jars up with more water. Wait, wait, Jesus, I don't think you get it. We need wine, not more water. The instructions that Jesus gives does not seem to be in line with the need. What Jesus tells the servant to do on the surface does not seem to resolve the issue. And this won't be the last time Jesus gives people instructions that seem unrelated to the need. Jesus, I'm having financial problems. I, I, I really need you to bless me financially. All right, I got the answer for you. You need to give and it shall be given. Wait, 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 Jesus. If I had it to give, I wouldn't be asking you to bless me financially. The, the answer that Jesus gives doesn't seem to fit the, the, the problem. J Jesus, I'm, I'm having problems with, 
with people who I work with. I, I just don't like them. They're constantly lying on me. They're, they're constantly trying to abuse their power. In, in, in fact, I even think a few of them want to see me fired. Okay, I got the answer that you need right now. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. Wait, Jesus, you don't understand. <laughs> the answer that you're giving me doesn't seem to match the need. One, one, one more. Jesus, I'm single. I've been single for a, a long, long time. I, I really wish that you would send me a godly mate so I could spend the rest of my life with. I, I got your answer. I need you to wait. Jesus, again, I don't think you understand the problem. I'm tired of waiting. <laughs> That's why I need you to act right now. There are times in our lives when Jesus will give us answers to questions that don't seem to fit the problem. But in response, our answer should not be to walk away. That's why many people walk away from the Christian faith, not because Jesus tells them to do something hard, but rather Jesus tells them to do something that they don't understand, something that se doesn't seem to match the need at the moment. But in those times when Jesus gives you instructions that doesn't seem to fit the, the question, your response should not be to seek understanding. Your response should be just to do it. Amen. The miracle occurs not in the servant's understanding what Jesus is doing, but the miracle occurs in the servant's performing what Jesus is doing. There are times in your life where you don't need to understand what Jesus tells you to do. You simply need to do what Jesus tells you to do. In 2 Kings chapter 5, we run into this man named Naaman. Naaman is the general of an incredible army, and God has blessed him with extreme victories. But, but Naaman has a problem. He has leprosy, a skin ailment that threatens his life. Fortunately for him, God puts him in the path of a slave girl who tells him that there is a prophet of God in Israel. And if Naaman seeks that prophet, that prophet will supply Naaman the answer that he's looking for. Naaman finds the prophet of God, Elisha. And Elijah, through his servant, tells Naaman that the way to get rid of his leprosy is to go dip himself seven times in the river Jordan. That, that's an answer that Naaman doesn't understand because the the Jordan in that day and age was as dirty and as nasty as the Hudson is today. How could bathing in dirty water get someone clean? So, so because Naaman doesn't understand, Naaman refuses to do it. On his way past the Jordan, his, his servant tells him, Naaman, if the man of God had told you to do something great, you would have done it. Why not just give this a try? In other words, what, what, the servant, what Naaman's servant says is that if he had told you to do something that was hard, you would have done it. The only reason you refuse to do it is because you don't understand. Naaman does it anyway. He goes down into the River Jordan. He, he dips one time. Nothing happens. He dips a, another time, nothing happens. Three, four, five, six times, nothing happens. And, and you could imagine that at this point, Naaman believes that his fears are being confirmed, that this doesn't make sense. But then on the seventh time, he went under. Bible says he rose up and his skin was as smooth as a baby. Central, you don't have to understand for it to work. You just have to do it. Jesus gives instructions to the servants that they that doesn't seem to match 
the need, but they do it anyway. And in doing it, the miracle happens. The, the, the miracle happens in, in the last part of our story, the verification, it, the confirmation of the miracle. There are two things about this miracle that stand out. First of all, the, the quantity of the wine. There were six stone jars, each holding to capacity 30 gallons. Jesus turned all six of those, the water in all six of those stone jars into wine, marking 180 gallons of wine. They was going to get lit that night. <laughs> and the quality of the wine, when, when the banquet, uh, uh, when the bank, the one presiding over the banquet finally tastes the wine, he remarks to Jesus that, that he remarks to, to the groom, bridegroom, that this is the, one of the best tasting wines he's, he's ever had. A, apparently there was a custom in these ancient weddings that they would first serve the quality wine so that their guests could get uh, inebriated, toasty, whatever you want to refer to it. But then after they had served the quality wine, when, when the guests could no longer distinguish between fine quality wine and, and bad wine, then the host would serve the, the wine that wasn't up to the quality as the previous kind. But, but the person at the banquet remarks that the exact opposite has taken place, that the groom served the best wine for last. Can, there's a bit of humor in this text. The groom doesn't know what the man is talking about. He has no idea what Jesus has done. So literally, he is taking credit for something that he had nothing to do with. Later on in, in John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus will say about his ministry that he came to give life and that life to the fullest. John chapter 2 is an example, an illustration of that. The, the quantity of the wine and the quality of the wine speaks of the quantity and the quality of the life that Jesus will give Jesus will give us life and that life to the fullest. There you have it, Central. The greatest miracle that Jesus ever did. Do you see it? <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Though I appreciate it. Uh, when I first heard this story, I found it difficult to believe that this was the greatest miracle that Jesus ever did. There are more spectacular miracles that Jesus performed. In comparison to the other miracles, this doesn't seem difficult at all. In comparison to, to raising up the dead, this doesn't seem to, to, to match. In, in comparison to causing blind eyes to see, this, this doesn't seem to, to match. In comparison to, to, to healing someone who had been sick with a disease their whole life, this doesn't seem to match, but, but in his book, The Life of Jesus, Critically Examined, Friedrich Strauss explains to us why this is the greatest miracle that Jesus ever did. In comparison to the, the other miracles, uh, the other miracles, Jesus was dealing with substances that were already there. When Jesus caused blind eyes to see what, what he was really doing was repairing something that was already there. When, when Jesus raised the dead, what he was really doing was reviving a life that was already there. When, when Jesus multiplied food, what he was simply doing was increasing something that was already there. But with the miracle of turning water into wine, Jesus is turning something into something else where the ingredients of that thing are not there. I, I, I don't have to tell this crowd nothing about wine. Y'all know about wine. <laughs> Visually, wine is different from water because the ingredients of the wine are not in the water. Even to a certain extent, the, the feel of wine is different from the feel of water because the ingredients of the wine are not in the water. And absolutely, the taste of wine 
is different from the taste of water because the ingredients of the wine are not in the water. And that's the point, that Jesus is transforming something that is not there. This is a miracle of absolute transformation. The ingredients of the wine are not in the water. And, and here's why it's significant for us this morning, Central. Because when God is getting ready to do something new in your life, the ingredients of that new thing don't have to be there. Nothing that God does in your life or in your situation needs to look anything like what God will transform it into. You don't have to get better for God to make you better. The ingredients of that person that you want to be doesn't have to be there because Jesus can turn water into wine. The ingredients of a healthy marriage don't have to be in your marriage right now. Some of you look at your marriage and you think that it will never be to the point that you want it to be. The good news is the ingredients don't have to be there. Jesus can turn water into wine. The situation that you're in doesn't have to look anything like the situation that you want to be in. The good news for us this morning is that Jesus can transform water into wine. The ingredients of your new situation doesn't have to be there. I, I, I thought I'd have more witness. That. That's okay. I, I brought my own. Come, come here, Moses. T tell the people your life story. Well, you, you, you've read about me in the Bible, and you know that I was one of the greatest leaders of Israel's past. But what you don't know is, before I became a, a leader of Israel, I was a cowardly killer who was shepherding sheep on the backside of the mountain. The, the ingredients of that great leader was not in me until God transformed me. Come here, Gideon. Speak to the people. Well, you, you, you know my story. I led this great army to defeat Israel's enemies. But, but what you don't know about me is that I was a coward, hiding away, not wanting to have anything to do with a fight. When, when God found me, the ingredients of that great warrior was not there. God in my life turned water into wine. C c come here, Peter. Speak to the people. I was a, a cussing, lying, air-cutting person when Jesus first met me. But Jesus turned the, the water of my life into wine. And now I'm one of the greatest preachers the church has ever known. C c come here, Paul. Speak to the people. I persecuted and murdered and, and killed Christians before Jesus turned water into wine in my life. And, and, and now you know me as the great theologian of the apostolic church. Central, what I'm trying to tell you is that you don't have to be anything like God will transform you into. The ingredients of what God will transform you into doesn't have to be there. God can change water into wine. God can transform people. God can transform situations. You don't have to look like, sound like, be like anything that God will transform you into. Wine is nothing like water. Doesn't look like water, doesn't feel like water, doesn't taste like water. The wine became the water, the water became the wine because of God's transforming power. You will become what God wants to turn you into.
because of God's transforming power. I'm, I'm through, but can I show you one more thing and then I'll promise <laughs> to sit down. And in verse 11, John writes that what Jesus did was the, in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed. That, that word translated first is the Greek word arche. It can refer to the, the first of a sequence, but, but normally it, it refers to what we would refer to as the archetype, the, uh, uh, a motif, uh, something that appears, reappears consistently in literature. What, what John is saying by referring to this as the arche is that as you read through the rest of my gospel, pay attention because you'll see what happened at Cana happen again. John also says in, in verse 1 that this event happened on the third day. But when you go back to John chapter 1, you read in, in verse 29 that on the next day, and then again in verse 55, the next day, and then again on, in verse 35 rather, the next day, and then again in, in verse 43, the next day, there are as many as five different periods where John calls the next day. Now John refers to the event that happened at Canaan as something that happened on the third day. Either John doesn't know how to count or, or this event at Cana is pointing to something else that would happen on the third day. Something else where God would transform something completely around. You, you, you read through the, the Gospel of John and, and you keep waiting for another Cana, for another miracle of, of transformation. Jesus heals blind eyes, but but that's not Cana. It's not a miracle of, of transformation. Jesus causes the lame to walk again, but, but that's not Cana. That's not a miracle of transformation. Jesus even raises the dead in John chapter 11. But again, that's not Cana. That's not a miracle of transformation. You, you continue to read through the gospel of John until you get to the later part of the Gospel of John. And, and John refers to something else that happened on the third day. Man was crucified and buried. But on the third day, some of his disciples came to the tomb. And they found the tomb empty. But as they walked into the tomb, they, they realized that the linen cloth was laid out and folded nicely. John, John says this so, so we can refer back to the miracle of Lazarus. Remember Lazarus? When, when Lazarus was, was brought out of the tomb, he still had the linen cloth wrapped around him. Jesus had to tell him, take the linen cloth off. Lazarus was revised, but he was not transformed. Now we see the linen cloth there and and when we encounter the man who rose again after the third day, we, we realize that he's not the same man that went into the grave. That, that man who rose on the third day has been completely transformed. This, this is what happened at Canaan. And the good news for us is that what happened to G at Canaan and what happened to Jesus will also happen to us. The Bible promises that one bright morning, when this life is over, God will completely transform you into the image of Jesus. You will be transformed. What God did at Cana in turning water into wine, God will also do to you. Will you pray with me this morning, Central? Father, we do thank you for your transforming power that we don't have to be anything like what we will be. The ingredients of our life to come doesn't have to be present in our life right now. Thank you for your transforming power that can turn water into wine. 
Now we pray, Father God, that you would turn the water of someone else's life into wine by bringing them into a saving relationship with your son, Jesus, that if they don't know Jesus through the power of your spirit, you would transform their hearts and their minds so that they would run to the cross and confess their sins unto Jesus and and and, and feel personally in their lives the, the life-transforming power. We, we pray that your spirit would work during this time, Lord God, as we give these last few minutes of our service to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.